Okay, perhaps we can make a start. So, greetings everyone to this sixth virtual meeting of the Community of Practice on Key Populations. And uh, I think this, this one is a really, really important meeting. Um, I'm Tim Sladden, I'm HIV advisor with UNFPA and one of the conveners of the Community of Practice. And I welcome you all today to this very important uh, seminar webinar on, on financing of and sustainability of key population programs. And uh, I think this is really one of the really important focuses that we really have to work on because we know now in this uh, current time, about 70% of all new HIV infections are in key populations or their sexual partners. But the amount of funding that key population programs get is really not proportional to that. It's, it's negligible. It's maybe 3% of all funding is directed towards key population programs. So it's significantly underfunded. And if we're going to really tackle the HIV pandemic and get on top of it, we have to allocate more funds and get more domestic financing for key population programs. The other thing we've got to do is to move from a perspective and a, a, a focus from donor external donor funds. We've got to move to more domestic financing from governments so that that's sustainable. And we know that the most effective programs are always led by key populations and communities. So it's all about getting domestic uh, national governments and local governments to contribute funds and financing to civil society community partners. And this is a, this is a social contracting model where the domestic um, financing comes from governments, national and local, but is contributed to community-based organizations that both represent key populations and provide community services to key populations. And I think it's very telling that we've had quite a lot of difficulty in actually finding uh, national partners who could contribute and uh, present at this webinar. And I think that's very, very telling that we're still a long way away from getting enough domestic governments uh, to think about this and to willingly contribute funds to domestic partners who are community based and um, for community led responses. And so we, we, we really have not had enough examples to present to you. We have some, but um, not enough. So today we're going to try and look at this from many different perspectives, from donors, from community organizations, um, from uh, national governments. And really, uh, I'd ask you all to think about how are we really going to scale up the, the financing and make it sustainable? What are the things we need to do to really make this um, a, a really, proportional response and a, a well-funded response um, that is going to change the course of the epidemic. Because if we don't add more financing for key population programs, it's just going to keep going and we're not going to reach the targets we have for 2030. Um, that's probably enough for me. And um, you can see on the screen, we've got uh, several different sessions here. First, we're going to look at the resource needs and the funding gaps, and we have a variety of, of global perspectives on that. And I'd like to ask Deepak Matur of UNAIDS to uh, open this up. And Deepak and all speakers in this session, you've got about eight minutes each um, for this first session. Can we turn it over to uh, Deepak? Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. <clears throat> Hello, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. I uh, hope you're all doing well. My name is Deepak Mathur. I'm a senior advisor on resource tracking with equitable financing practice at UNAIDS Geneva. So in today's presentation, I'll be briefly talking about 
some of the assumptions made on the global resource needs targets for prevention and key population. And then about the funding landscape for HIV in low and middle income countries. I believe this may be relevant to understand how it may affect the funding for key population programs. Finally, I'll be talking about the estimated resource needs targets for prevention and key population services and presenting, presenting some data on resource availability reports on low and middle income countries. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So essentially, uh, the resource needs target for prevention services among key populations are based on the broader prevention targets that are shown on the table. Going further details into that. Next slide, please. So the global targets for HIV prevention were defined based on geographical risk and behavioral risk or both. HIV programs for sex workers are categorized by national prevalence, while those for MSM, transgender, and prisoners are categorized by incidence within those populations. For PWID, high-risk settings are considered to be those with low coverage of needle syringe programs and OST. Medium-risk settings are those with some services for NSP and NST. More details of this can be found on the PLUS One publication. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So talking about the funding landscape for HIV services overall in low and middle income countries, in 2021, US dollar 21.4 billion was available for HIV programs in low and middle income countries. The cascading effects of the COVID-19 crisis and recently the war in Ukraine now present additional challenges. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic and its associated economic disruptions, the resources for HIV in low and middle income countries had been leveling off. As a result, the 21.4 billion available in 2021 was well short of the 29.3 billion needed in 2025 in order to end the epidemic by 2030. Next slide, please. So in general, the largest gap for funding is in low or lower middle income countries, about US dollar 3.5 billion compared to what's available and what's needed by 2025. The resource available in those countries for 2021 fell 55% short of the projected needs for 2025. And the economic impact of COVID-19 pandemic in some of those countries is also likely to be severe, making it even more difficult for them to close the funding gaps. Next slide, please. Now, the domestic resources were the main driver of the growth in total resources during the last decade. The growth of domestic resources and the increases became smaller and smaller from mid-2010 onwards and then halted in 2018. And these are challenging trends for funding architecture because domestic investments in HIV account for 60% of total resources. Now, international resources were about 6% lower in 2021 than in 2010, and they had already declined steadily since 2012 and 2013. The overall reductions have been much steeper had it not been sustained and high levels of fundings were maintained by the United States government and the Global Fund, which have increased by about 36% and 56% respectively since 2010. Next slide, please. Next one. Yeah. So talking about funding for prevention, based on the latest available data reported to the UNAIDS Global AIDS Monitoring by 96 countries, an average of 8% of total spending was reported to be spent on prevention interventions. Now, as per the global targets, it was estimated that on average, 33% of all resources across low and middle income countries were to be spent on prevention by 2025. Next slide, please. So in the previous slide, it was described that an average of 33% of resources were to be spent on prevention interventions in all low and middle income countries. But this is to illustrate that this share varies widely across regions and countries based on their epidemic profiles. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, donor commitments for HIV prevention have improved it uh, improved in recent years, but there continues to be large gap in funding for HIV prevention programs across income groups. Compared to the estimates assessed in baseline year of 2019, an almost doubling of resources is needed to reach the US dollar 9.5 billion 
that will be required for HIV prevention in 2025 in order to put the countries on track to end the AIDS epidemic. Now, resource needs estimated for key population services account for 60% of the total estimated reach, uh, resource needs for prevention. Next slide, please. Now, funding for key HIV prevention among key populations really com comprise very small proportions of the total HIV spending in low and middle income countries, even in regions where the vast majority of new infections are occurring in these new in, in, in these populations. On average, only 3% of total reported expenditures by 61 countries were reported to be spent on key population services. Next slide, please. Now, the bulk of that funding, at least two thirds comes from international resources with interventions for prisoners and detainees being the only exception the reliance exposes uh, reliance of international funding exposes prevention programs for key population uh, to potential further cuts in international funding. Next slide, please. You can start wrapping up soon, Deepak. <clears throat> yeah. Perhaps we can uh, go to the next one. So essentially, uh, the funding for key population prevention. Uh, the share of prevention spending and overall spending is not matching the resource needs in several countries. For example, some countries that are expected to increase the prevention spending share in double digit only report less than 10% of total spending on prevention services. And sometimes it's even less than 5% of total spending allocation to key, allocated to key population services. Next slide, please. Clearly, the willingness to pay from domestic sources for key population services also varies across countries. While some countries fund key population services more than 90% through domestic resources, but for other key population services, the programs are mostly reliant on external sources of funding. The local laws and other cultural barriers are to be addressed to sustain funding for key populations programs. Next one. Next slide, please. I believe this is the last one. Sorry, go back. Uh, one slide back, please. Thank you. So there is mixed progress amid an uh, uneven investment. If we compare the total resources available in 2021 <clears throat> against those required to meet the 2025 targets, the funding gaps also vary across regions. In some regions, the 2021 resources are close to the total needs in 2025, but in others, the gaps are quite large. They range from a 13% gap in Western Central Africa and a 57% gap in Asia and the Pacific to 82% gap in Middle East and North Africa. Importantly, all regions need to use these resources with greater efficiency. But without a prioritized funding for HIV prevention among key population, the trend of increasing HIV infections observed in several regions will continue to rise. The future cost of inaction will be huge. And as described in earlier slides, the funding landscape for HIV is in danger. And this is not the time for cuts, but rather an increased global solidarity and increased domestic investments in prevention programs and HIV and key population services is a need of the hour. Thank you. Over. Great. Thanks so much, Deepak, for that introduction. That's a very good overview. And um, whilst it's encouraging to see that there is enough funds in some countries in East and Southern Africa, it's um, alarming or it's, it's a wake up call that we see there's many, many parts of the world where there's not enough uh, funding at all for key population programs. And thank you for the other thing you noted that we also need to focus upstream on the prevention funding. It's critical if we're going to stop people getting new infections and then needing lifelong treatment, obviously. So we've got to move upstream to the prevention. Um, OK, so now let's move over to a view from the World Bank, looking at some of the uh, allocative efficiency analyses that are being conducted. And we have Nicole Fraser Hunt from the World Bank. It's going to uh, take us through this. Thank you, Nicole. Hi, everybody, and I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to this webinar. Uh, so I'm going to present about these allocative efficiency analysis, which we have been conducting using the Optima HIV software. And I must say, over the years of doing this type of analysis, it's probably the KP investment angle, which was the most important. Next slide, please. 
So these analyses are designed to help decision-making, support decision-making in uh, best possible allocations of scarce HIV resources, and therefore also to plan for sustainability. And uh, the studies usually answer questions like, how many more infections and deaths can be prevented if resource allocations were optimized. And that's the strength of the software that it does mathematical opti optimization of resources. And you can also do a scenario analysis. So for instance, what resources are needed to achieve targets at different um, funding envelopes. And then again, with this optimized um, approach to allocations. The studies are usually done in partnership with governments, global fund, CDC, uh, the World Bank, modelers and others. And I think it's the partnership um, approach which really helps to um, then have these studies owned by funders and by decision makers at country level. The studies are quite intense, so the model uh, needs uh, health data, epidemic response, cost effectiveness data, and um, it is usually most gainful if several cycles of these studies can be done, because then you have a populated model which you can update. Next slide, please. I can't see, yeah. So this is just a glimpse of the user interface you see when you use the model. And I always want to keep this KP angle today. So um, this is the screen you see when you um, define programs. Uh, you want to include or interventions in the model. And you can, of course, have KP targeted interventions included. You can add additional ones, innovative ones. You can um, re-specify what's in the model. And um, this is just one of the of several screens you get on the user interface. Next slide, please. And very quickly, how every person in a population is sort of located within the model. So in one way, um, the population is uh, disaggregated is by um, subgroup, you know these subgroups well from other models, and I want to show the Cambodia example, 13 different KP uh, subgroups have been identified, for instance, female entertainment workers were disaggregated by client volume, MSM uh, subpopulations were disaggregated by whether they are known and reachable or not yet reached. And then on the right hand side, you see how every person also sits in a little compartment in the model based on care status. So whether you're undiagnosed or diagnosed or linked to care and also by your uh, presumed CD4 status. So that's how um, everybody appears somewhere in this model. And at country level, we do spend time explaining the model because we think that the more you understand how the model works and what's going into the model, the more you can trust the data. Next slide, please. So a few applications, and I won't go into detail because of time constraints. This was the large global application where we really wanted to see um, what is the big picture um, result of applying the model across 44 countries, which included 80% of all PLHIV worldwide. And it looked at the last reported allocation in each of these countries and then um, computed the optimal allocation to minimize new infections by 2030. And it um, showed, it suggested that without any additional funding, almost seven and a half million new HIV infections could be averted with optimal allocation. So this was really 26% of overall incidence reduction worldwide with better resource allocation. And interesting, the most common priorities of reallocation were the scale up of prevention and treatment interventions for KPs it in each of their um, regional settings. And I have put little orange frames around all these results, which show that there should be more PVIT targeted investment, more FSW targeted investment across most regions of the world. Next slide, please. 
Now, three country applications, and I'm not going into detail. These studies are a bit complicated to present quickly, but you will have it in your resources. So first example, Belarus. This is a country where three Optima applications have happened over the years. And then we looked back last year, we had an evaluation and looked back at the utility. And sort of the big picture findings was that it, these applications of the software really informed decisions on not only on spending for HR, of ART, but also PVID interventions. The studies played a significant role in supporting internal legislative discussions, which led to state commitments in Belarus for increasing OST and provision of take home doses. It also supported this whole advocacy process of funding and getting funding from Global Fund and how to allocate it smartly so that it would be impactful. Then in every application there are unit costs um, calculated and often they are really useful at country level for their budgeting and planning. Next slide please. We've got to move along so yeah yep. sorry. That's fine. Um, we uh, managed to um, assess the impact of reallocations, which were done post optima analysis. And the study really demonstrated that many more new infections and deaths could be averted with um, better allocations. Next slide, please, on Kazakhstan. And here, all I want to say is this is an epidemic which is dominated by MSM related transmission. And the model application showed that without any further budget, um, there should be much more allocation to MSM prevention services and PWID NSP programs. And if there was more budget, then um, again, much more should also be allocated to MSM prep and PWID prevention, other PVID prevention services. Next slide, please. And we then looked at the um, resource needs for um, having um, certain targets met. And um, again, just that, like Deepak showed, there is much more resource need. And I'm going to jump the Cambodia example, which just um, Next slide, please, which looked at outreach modalities which are not yet implemented. It looked at the possible impact of these modalities in, an, in a response which is already um, fairly optimally uh, conducted. And I want to go to the last slide of take home messages. So the first two are about the model and how it can really uh, support the decision making. Then my third point is that it generates really valuable discussions in the process of the study on uh, intervention cost coverage, effectiveness and budgetary priority setting. And decision makers react positively when you can quantify these investment impacts especially if they understand the modeling process and if trust in the model has been built through participation and repeat applications. And then my last point, allocative efficiency analysis has been shown to support the advocacy, the legislative and the technical discussions in prioritizing KP interventions. It also helps protect targeted KP investments because it shows the um, disproportionate impact these investments have. And there have been shown these studies to move the needle towards KP focused resource allocation, both by governments, but also by donors. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nicole. Really interesting and uh, showing it's not just uh, about getting more funds, we have to use them in the most efficient and effective way. And these models are really, uh, incredibly sophisticated and detailed how you can disaggregate and really uh, get into the details of the situations of individuals. I think that's really telling. And this slide really says it all about such a great advocacy tool when we're discussing with uh, governments about what they could achieve if they did put more money into key population programs. I think it's all evidence-based and it's really strong in how uh, to help governments make these decisions and to uh, hopefully move that needle and 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 increase their trust and uh, allocation to these the most impactful programs that are needed with key populations. 
Okay, thank you, Nicole. Um, now we're going to look at from a, um, a uh, bilateral donor. We've got um, Naroesha Jagasaya from uh, AIDS Fund on the line. And um, I'll turn it over to Naroesha to give AIDS Fund's uh, perspective. Thank you, Tim. Um, indeed, my name is Narusha Jigisa and I work at AIDS Fonds uh, in the International Department for Key Population Programming. And I manage the largest Dutch funded uh, international key population program, which is called the Love Alliance. And today I'm here, as you can see, to speak on where the money for key population programming is or actually is not. Um, I'll turn my camera off uh, so you can focus on the slides if that's okay. Um, so next slide, please, because uh, I think it's quite clear also from the speakers that we had this morning um, or this afternoon for some people that the need for key population programming is very clear. And as you can see, according to the latest number of units, 70% of the new HIV infections um, occur amongst people who use drugs, sex workers, LGBTI people and their sexual partners. And this is actually an increase from 65% um, last year, 54% the year before. And uh, even though this is increasing, the overall uh, numbers or the overall HIV incidence has been declining. So this really, really shows the need. And it shows that these communities continue to bear the brunt of the epidemic. Um, the decriminalization, discrimination, stigma and violence they face, which prevents them from accessing the services that they need, which makes them many times more vulnerable to become HIV infected, as you can see. Next slide, please. Well, luckily, uh, the international community is more and more committed to address this. It's recognized that intersecting injustices drive new HIV infections and that it's key to address inequalities and restrictive policies if we want to get back on track in reaching our target of ending AIDS by 2030. Next, please. Yes, and it's, as you can see, it's really needed to get back on track because the fast track target is two years beyond, beyond its deadline, still not close and reaching. And the burden on key pops has even increased, as I mentioned before. Um, it's proven also, by the way, that the data reported by many countries underestimate the size of key populations. So leaving tens of millions of people in greatest needs virtually invisible to the national HIV plans and programs. So the need is really clear. There's also guidelines and evidence that are clear about the importance of involving key populations in programming to be more exclusive, effective, and sustainable. So with all the data, evidence, and commitments, how come we're still not reaching our targets? Well, that's because we need to put our money where our mouth is. Let me show you, if we can go to the next slide. Thank you, yes. So AIDS funds commissioned a study to look at the funding for key populations within the HIV response in the first three years of the fast track strategy, 2016 to 2018. Uh, the research was launched two years ago and it was one of the most, if not the most comprehensive map mapping to date. It looked at funding for HIV programming at global, regional, national levels, including the domestic expenditures and investments by all the major donors. While it's very comprehensive, it doesn't represent the full picture because um, there is a lack sometimes of available data, lack of transparency and inconsistency in the recording of data. Funding is also not always dis disaggregated for key populations. So for prevention programs, this was often better, understandably, but that was just a fifth of the funding. But let's have a look if we go to the next slide. Thank you. Yes. So in the period of 2016 to 2018, 1.3 billion um, was invested in key populations programming. And these are the major fundings, uh, funders. So while 1.3 billion sounds like a lot, if you put this in perspective of the total funding for the HIV response, the picture is less exciting. Next, please. Yes. So only 2% of the funding for HIV programming went to key populations. And this is for the overall HIV programming. For prevention programming, it was a little bit better because we had more disaggregated data. It was 11%. But still, keeping in mind the 70% burden, at that time, 54% of the burden, it's still very much out of proportion. Uh, next, please. Um, and if we look at the specific communities, it becomes even less than the 2%, as you can see here. 
Um, and as I, I saw, I showed you at the beginning of uh, my presentation, now it says 20 times uh, more at risk for um, MSM, for instance, it's now 28% for female sex workers, it's instead 21%, it's 30, uh, 21 times more vulnerable, it's 30 times more vulnerable. So all these numbers have now increased. Unfortunately, the funding has not. And as you can see, it's, it's very, very little that goes to the actual communities. So we didn't only compare the funding to the needs in terms of the burden, as you can see here, but we also look at the needs in terms of costing to show the actual resource gap. And that's on the next slide. So UNAIDS costed the funds needed to address the needs of key populations uh, in the first three years of the fast track strategy at 6.8 billion. As you can see, this means an 80% shortfall. And this gets actually worse if we look at funding gaps in the low and middle income countries. Next, please. These countries accounted at that time for 89% of the new infections. At, um, but as you can see, the, the gap is over 90%. In some, in some regions, it's even 98 to 99%. As you can see in Latin America, um, South and Eastern, Southern and Eastern Africa. So whatever way you look at it, in terms of burden or funding gaps, it's really essential to fund key populations to get back on track. Next, please. Yes. So at the high level meeting of last year, member states committed to increase and fully fund the AIDS response. They agreed to invest 29 billion annually by 2025 in low and middle income countries. However, it's key that this is invested in the right way. Based on the research that we did, uh, we have some recommendations, as you can see here. So first of all, a significant amount of the HIV funding needs to be invested in key populations programming. Secondly, it needs to be in community-led interventions. This will increase inclusiveness, effectiveness, and sustainability. Thirdly, investing in services only will not be enough. Funding needs to be made available for advocacy for key populations' rights as an enabling environment without criminalization, stigma, discrimination is key to enable access to the services needed. And lastly, we need to systematically track and record our funding with disaggregated data so that we can keep track of other account and keep each other accountable to our commitments. And if we uh, go to the next slide, I want to add um, something from that underscores this all. Yeah almost done. Uh, a recent impact study from the Robert Carr Fund also shows that long-term flexible and core funding is critical for civil society and community-led networks in the global HIV response. So this is my last slide. It's about the Love Alliance uh, that I mentioned before, because all these ambitions, they sound so um, ambitious, <laughs> or the recommendations sound ambitious, but it's needed and it is possible. So with the Love Alliance, we have 63 million euros available um, and as you can see here, it's an advocacy focused program for with and for key populations, and at least 60% of the funds go directly to local community led organizations and the bulk we use participatory grant making for, which means that the communities actually decide themselves what and who gets funded for this based on the needs that they see. Well, if you want to learn more about this or about the study, so both about the Love Alliance and the study that I presented, you can go to our website. The link is here, and uh, I'll be available in the Q&A for any questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Naresha. It's uh, really very important uh, data, and uh, it's very stark, isn't it? The mismatch between the funding and the need for key population programming and the finances needed to fully fund uh, good key population programs. And um, it, it shows it's not just our programming that needs to be evidence-based, our funding and financing needs to be evidence-based. And I think your uh, report there, fast track or off track, I think this really should be um, compulsory reading for all countries to, to think about this really seriously. And, we should perhaps recirculate your report if there's countries that haven't seen it. Um, it really shows what we need to do and, 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 and how we need to change in the future. Okay, we've got two more speakers um, really looking at the two main, multi, uh, two main donors for um, 
the HIV response. And we have first the Global Fund, and I call on uh, Matteo Casolato to uh, give the Global Fund response um, perspective. Thank you. Matteo, yeah, please. Thank you, Tim. Hi, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be with you all today. Thank you for giving uh, Global Fund an opportunity to uh, talk about key populations funding. Uh, I'll also switch off my camera so you can focus on the on the slides. And um, because I only have a little, a few minutes, let's maybe jump jump straight into it with the next slide, please. So my starting point here is the Global Fund strategy that, as you know, will uh, will start being implemented starting January uh, 2023. And within it, uh, two uh, commitments, two important commitments that we're making in this strategy. And the first one really is about uh, decreasing the number of new HIV infections for HIV, TB, and malaria. I'm going to focus obviously on HIV here. And within that, really, the uh, importance of uh, implementing what we call uh, precision combination prevention approaches that are tailored to the various uh, needs of the subpopulations uh, and key populations, but really looking also at segregating by gender where possible and also by age groups, if we have the data available. Another important commitment that we're making in the, normal, in the new strategy is one around uh, positioning health finance as a fundamental part of ending AIDS, TB, and malaria, and using the Global Fund role to really catalyze as much as possible domestic resources for health and for key populations. Next slide, please. And let's have a look uh, back uh, to begin with, right, at where stands uh, funding for key, uh, for key and vulnerable population at the Global Fund. And here we are comparing uh, the share of funding uh, that went to key and vulnerable population as a share of the total HIV envelope for three, for three different budget periods. You have the 2015-2017 budget period, the 2018 to 2020, and the 2021 to 2023, which is the current one. So the red bar shows the uh, HIV um, envelope, you know, the HIV allocation. And if you focus on the little pink stripes at the bottom, you'll see what was the uh, contribution to key and vulnerable population. Now you can see how this has been increasing over time, albeit quite uh, slightly. It went from 6.9 to 8.2 to 10.6% in the current cycle. And as much as it's good, because you know, there is a positive trend if you want, it needs to be pointed out, as it was uh, pointed out by all my colleagues before, that the contribution is still insufficient to uh, really reach the needs of key populations. So, uh, you know, just to, this is the key message. It's a, you know, it's an increasing trend, but still not not good enough. Let's have a look also at the future a bit in terms of indicators with the next slide and looking at what is the um, new key performance indicator that we will be using in the new strategy to measure how well we're doing with uh, prevention for key populations. And this is uh, an indicator that really is based on tracking the performance of all key populations programs funded by the Global Fund. Uh, to make this indicator work well, it's really important to say that we need uh, to have uh, both uh, size estimates that are as much as possible close to the real number, that are you know, of high quality, that are reliable and validated with communities, but also that you know the targets itself in these um, programs are as much as possible ambitious and aligned to the ones that were presented earlier by uh, UNAIDS. You know, really uh, ambitious and aligned to uh, the global uh, the global guidance on it. And how do we make this happen? How do we have reliable size estimates and good targets? We do that via uh, our partnership with uh, communities and particularly with key populations-led organizations. We need to ensure uh, through their engagement that grants and the grants are designed as much as possible to tackle, uh, to provide all the key services as well as tackling structural barriers to accessing services like human rights barriers or gender barriers. And also to ensure the key populations are involved in the implementation of these services and also in their, in their monitoring. And let's maybe with the next slide start to focus a bit more into what are the different strategies the Global Fund has to support increased funding for key populations. And there's three main ones I would like to touch on. The first one in yellow you see is the key populations leadership and engagement strategy. Second one is the catalytic funding. And third is our sustainability transition and co-financing strategy. And with the next slide, let's go on and look at the first one in yellow, the key populations leadership and engagement. 
So why is this important? Well, as you can imagine, you know, when we have uh, key population organizations and communities that are really leading uh, the response, that are taking decisions that concern their own health, so they are properly engaged, when we have all these three elements, then we do normally have, you know, contributions within the global fund country allocations that are higher uh, for key populations. Because as you know, those decisions in terms of what to fund are entirely driven by country ownership processes where you know, the various partners come together to agree on what needs to be funded. Where we see that when communities are engaged in these processes, then there are higher contributions to key populations. And in starting from this cycle, we've, we have also introduced what we call program essentials that are those particular services that speak to the needs of key populations that we're asking countries to tell us how are they funding it. Another important uh, element of, of, of supporting leadership and engagement is the support that we provide as Global Fund to, to really engage communities via technical assistance, by also capacity development programs. And from this year, we have also introduced what we call minimum expectations for community engagement, that throughout the country dialogue process, look at how we can engage civil society to get to know what happens to the funding request what is being funded, what is not being funded, and particularly when a funding enters the grant making phase, then we want CCM to be able to inform timely communities on what's happening to the uh, interventions for key populations that were initially included in the grant. Are there, and if anything, for instance, is being taken out, that then they are uh, timely informed, so you know, uh, discussions can, be, can, take in place, can, can take place. And now look at the catalytic uh, funding side with the next slide, here you see, the entire picture that was just approved at the last board in November. As you can see at the total, it's difficult to read, but just to give you an idea, uh, the total amount approved for catalytic funding is of 400 million. This includes, of course, matching funds, strategic initiatives, and uh, multi-country grants. You see in red at the top, the for HIV, uh, a total of 54 million has been uh, allocated. Uh, it's too early now to go in, into, sub, into the subdivisions between matching funds, multi-country grants, and strategic initiatives because uh, you know mm, conversations with partners are still taking place. But uh, just for you to know that you know for uh, to support key populations programming, it's not just about the HIV uh, part; it's also about the intervention that exists uh, under the RSSH, for instance, the strategic initiatives of breaking down barriers that supports the removal of human rights and gender related barriers. And also, for instance, the community engagement the strategic initiative, which, which also will still be there uh, in the next funding cycle. And moving on to my last slide, which is around the sustainability transition and co-financing policy. Well, the first thing to say that I think it's important is that we look at this as my very much interlinked elements. So not in isolation, the policy uh, for these uh, elements has not changed. So it's good to know that you know, it's still uh, going to be used in the next funding cycle. And how do we interpret it? And how can I explain it to you in a way that makes sense? So if you see uh, this slide, you look at, there are four main columns. And I want you to look at the focus of application and the co-financing requirements and parameters to access the co-financing incentive. So these two change based on the income level of the country and on a disease burden. So you can tell, for instance, if you focus on the last row at the bottom, you will see that, for instance, for a country like South Africa, that it is upper middle income country and has a severe or extreme burden of disease, then the requirement is that is for the application to be fully focused on key populations and vulnerable populations, and also for the co-financing um, parameters to access the co-financing incentives, you know, 50% of the uh, interventions funded need to be based on key populations. And this is another, I guess, the third lever that we have at the global fund level to support uh, key populations funding. And I'll stop here and take any questions if you have any. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks a lot, Matteo. Uh, really interesting. And as always, the global fund have really uh, thought hard and come up with these um, policies and uh, guidance criteria for funding. and really going into the specifics. And I think you complement Nicole's work from the World Bank very well in terms of uh, specifying exactly how best we can uh, allocate funds and, and target them into the most effective way of uh, using the Global Fund grants um, in the country. So really uh, very important for the country offices and um, national governments and, and CCMs to consider how best to 
use the global fund grants in, in the most in their responses uh, again focusing on key population epidemics that we need to try to make sure we have enough resources to uh, bring them to curb them good um, okay we come to our last panelist here from one of the major bilateral donors pepfar um, as we all know it's been a long-standing a contributor to the um, AIDS pandemic. And um, we have Ugona Ijioma, who is going to give us PEPFAR's perspective. Thank you, Ugona. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Ugona Ijioma, and I'm a medical officer within the Key Populations team at the Division of Global HIV and TB at CDC headquarters. In addition, I also serve as one of the co-leads on PEPFAR's KP Communities of Practice, which is an internal interagency headquarter group that tracks and supports KP programming across all of PEPFAR. Next slide, please. At the onset, we want to show PEPFAR's most recent financial numbers for key populations. This table reflects the overall investments that have been tagged for KP investment across all our countries. You can see the total for COP22, which is impl being implemented from October of 2022 to September of 2023, is 276 million. Our systems are further able to divide this by specific KP group, though you will see a significant portion is noted as not disaggregated, which is often indicative of programming that is serving multiple key populations. Funds are also tagged by program area. Because this is a GPC webinar, we focus on the total amount tagged to prevention services, including PrEP. The other major program areas where the remainder of funds are tagged are testing, care and treatment, and above site programming. We strive to make our data public, and you can find all this data in the link shown. Next slide, please. We've just shown you the financial numbers, and this slide and the following will describe what those funds are supporting in the countries we support, during current implementation. We believe that the, these are the essential approaches for key population programming, and this is where we need to focus for sustaining our KP investments and advancing programming. First, we need to ensure we have a clear understanding of the specific KP cascades. Then we need to ensure services offered in public facilities are KP competent while still maintaining support for KP-led services in community settings and supporting KP leadership. Finally, we need to mitigate structural barriers to accessing these services. Key point here is meeting KPs where they are at, serving them in spaces that meet their needs, such as KP-specific drop-in centers, public facilities, or private clinics and pharmacies. In addition, efforts need to be both fiscal and virtual, and I will now go into each of the points above in more detail. Next slide. To understand our gaps, we need to invest in various cost-effective surveillance strategies. This may include population size estimates, formal biobehavioral surveillance studies, small area surveys, and or triangulating programmatic data to inform the response. It is also vital that KP leaders and communities are engaged and involved in the implementation of these strategies. Next slide, please. Members of KP groups have different preferences on where they want to access services, and it is important that our programming is responsive to these preferences. For KPs that prefer to seek services in more anonymous public facilities, we need to ensure that these services are KP competent. This is achieved through training or sensitizing health facility, clinic and frontline staff on KP competency based on WHO and PEPFAR guidance tailoring prevention and treatment services to meet unique needs of health, um, KPs, offering clinical mentorship to maintain services, hiring KPs as prevention and treatment service providers, and partnering with KP-led KP CSOs as community health workers. Next slide, please. For community-led services such as drop-in centers and one-stop shops, PEPFAR will continue to support efforts to diversify funding schemes for sustainability. This includes securing policies and mechanisms in support of social contracting and encouraging national governments to directly fund the CSO efforts. 
In addition, PEPFA promotes social enterprise schemes, utilizing market-based approaches to generate revenue for the CSOs via business entities. For example, PEPFA KP CSO partners in Thailand and Vietnam have formalized their community clinics to accept health insurance and direct fee for services. In other countries, KP-led organizations are strengthening their capacity to conduct fee-based competency training for staff in public facilities as an income generating activity. These market-based solutions are combined with PEPFA and government support to further sustain efforts. And this is often referred to as a blended approach. Next slide, please. A KP response cannot be sustainable until it addresses the overarching barriers that make KPs vulnerable and impede their access to services. PEPFA supports efforts to mitigate barriers to accessing HIV services that are often called structural interventions. These include four key areas, fostering enabling policy environments by supporting efforts around decriminalization of same-sex activity, promoting anti-discrimination efforts, or engaging Ministry of Justice to limit harm caused by law enforcement. Can we do one more slide? Can we click one once more? Oh, no, please go back. There's a, there's a missing point here, but it's okay. Mitigating KP-led um, um, stigma, discrimination, and violence by sensitizing healthcare workers via KP competency trainings. Engaging KP-led CSOs by strengthening their capacity and diversifying their funding streams or strengthening the leadership and professional ca uh, capacity of KP leaders themselves. Meeting the needs of KP uh, communities by supporting human rights, violence, monitoring systems, or providing social protections for KPs, including socioeconomic opportunities. PEPFA has been working to align our investments with other development partners, such as Global Fund, Dutch Government, Elton John AIDS Foundation, as well as other USG agencies, such as the Department, uh, the State Department's Global Equity Fund, or USAID's Bureau of Investigation, Bureau, Bureau of Development, Democracy and Inclusion, to ensure PEPFA investments are complementary. Next slide, please. So the prior slides described our budget programming and priorities for COP22. Now we look to the future. With our new PEPFA um, ambassador, Dr. John Nkengason, we have launched a new three by five strategy to sustain PEPFA gains. You will notice that pillar one focuses on equity for priority populations, which includes KPs. Hence, it is a core part of our strategy moving forward. Other pillars include sustaining the response, securing public health systems and security, maintaining transformative partnerships and following the science. In addition, the first enabler of these pillars is community leadership. We look forward to working with you all to hold us accountable to these pillars and enablers. Next slide, please. The three by five strategy is the cornerstone of the new PEPFA five-year strategy. It was launched in July this year at the AIDS 2022 conference, followed by the strategic direction at the UNGA in September. On December 1st, World AIDS Day, we released the new strategy based on listening sessions the ambassador and his team had done with many stakeholders. PEPFA's new strategy is based on coordinated efforts with UNAIDS and the Global Fund as well. Within our strategy, core points for, uh, for KPs include the following. KP leadership is needed to close service delivery gaps. High quality data is needed to understand the gaps in the KP epidemic and structural barriers need to be dismantled. Next slide. Before I close, I wanted to take a moment to highlight our upcoming process. We are working towards the mid-February launch of our COP22, sorry, COP, COP ROP23 process, which is when we will begin the planning for the next fiscal year. As noted earlier, we just released our new five-year PEPFA strategy, and you can find it in the link included on this slide. On December 16th, we'll be hosting a virtual health equity global workshop to co-create a roadmap of program priorities and partnerships to identify and close the major gaps in service delivery and new infections for priority populations, including key populations. Key questions will be around the new partnerships necessary, specific interventions to create an enabling policy or social environment for HIV service delivery, how to strengthen community leadership, ensuring new treatment and prevention tools, 
and options are people-centered. If you're interested in attending, we welcome your participation and the registration link is also included in the slide. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Ugona. Very, very interesting as well. And good to, uh, we're starting to get some resonance and uh, seeing the uh, agreement on what is important and how best to work and the evidence base on how to really allocate resources to the most effective and impactful programs. And I think PEPFAR's example there is a really world, world class in how best we can uh, use the funds that are available. So thank you. I'd like to thank all the panel who've given us a, a lot to think about, who've given us um, a really good overview and introduction. Unfortunately, we have to keep up the pace. We're already behind. Um, I see there's already some discussion going on in the Q&A, which is good. And uh, I appreciate all of the people contributing and those who are um, responding to some of those questions there. I don't have time to, to look at them. But um, now we're going to see, we've had this overview at the global level and from uh, major donors. Now we're going to hear from India, from the National AIDS Control Program in India, um, how these, um, an example of, of how resources are allocated to key population programs. And we have Dr. Shobini Rajan from India um, National AIDS Control Program. Dr. Shobini, please uh, take the floor. Thanks, Tim. Uh, it is my privilege to be part of the community of practice on key populations as part of the Global Prevention Coalition's South to South Learning Network. Um, and with the permission of the chairperson, uh, I'd like to uh, move on to the first slide. Uh, to introduce myself, I'm uh, Dr. Shobini Rajan. I uh, head the prevention program along with the program for testing and STIs in the National AIDS Control Organization, Ministry of Health India, which is responsible for the National AIDS Control Program and the response um, in India. So my presentation will have uh, all these areas, but I'd like to uh, ensure that I'll stick to the timelines by going over some of the earlier part quickly. So the next slide, please. So uh, for those of us who are not aware, the uh, National AIDS Control Program is presently in its fifth phase of implementation, but the activities for key populations uh, who are who were and continue to be referred to as high risk group uh, people have been there since the very first phase. Next, please. Yeah. So uh, the epidemic in India continues to be a concentrated epidemic uh, with an estimated 2.4 million people living with HIV, 63,000 annual new infections, and 1.6 million people living with HIV on ART, making it uh, the second largest largest uh, numbers of PLHIVs in the world. And if you can uh, look at the right side, uh, it is evident that uh, the prevalence of HIV among the hijra transgender persons, the injecting drug users, men having sex with men, inmates, and female sex workers, according to our HIV sentinel surveillance that we conduct every two years, is much higher than that in the general population. Next, please. And therefore, the phase four, phase five, uh, lays a lot of emphasis on reducing annual new HIV infection, which is the first goal. Second goal of reducing AIDS-related mortalities. The third of eliminating vertical transmission of both HIV and syphilis. The fourth being promoting universal access to quality STI, RTI. And the fifth being elimination of HIV AIDS-related stigma and discrimination. And these are aligned towards the uh, goals of ending the AIDS epidemic as a public health threat by 2030. Next, please. Uh, the slide on funding uh, indicates that despite having COVID, uh, NACP five budgets of an overall outlay of, uh, this is in INR crores 15471, which roughly translates into uh, 1.9 billion US dollars, was provisioned and this is an all-time high that uh, India got allocated domestically 
with the global fund contributing to 6% of the overall uh, budget with 94% of the budget being domestically supported. And the support that we get from PEPFAR and other partners is outside of the budget. So it is extra budget. Next. Uh, in terms of the systems and structures that we have under NACP uh, for key population, uh, there is a social contracting system in place, which we call as targeted interventions, targeted being uh, targeted towards the key populations, and a scheme for rural India called link worker scheme. And along with it, an ongoing process of programmatic mapping and population size estimation, HIV sentinel surveillance, analysis of program continues. And additionally, we as services are also offering opioid substitution therapy for people living with uh, people who inject drugs. Uh, there is community engagement because uh, the targeted interventions by design are peer led interventions with the community uh, actually delivering the services. And the TIs function on standard guidelines. And uh, there is a lot of monitoring and uh, mentoring by the various systems of state aids control societies, strategic technical expertise unit, etc. And we also have in place a third party evaluation system. Uh, and within the existing interventions, we do look at innovations. Next, please. So the social contracting under NACP has been documented with the support of UNAIDS, and this is a document which can be accessed from both the UNAIDS and the NACO websites. And uh, as I indicated, uh, the social contracting mechanism is practically ingrained into the program. So at this point of time, there is no question of sustainability as such because it is fully domestically funded and it is part of the program. Next, please. So please keep uh, pressing next. This is just a slide on how we establish a TI project where uh, the state aid societies release an expression of interest. And there is a joint team which conducts a desk review and then finally decides on which organization is going to be given uh, the project. And finally, uh, a letter is issued awarding the project. And these funds are part of the annual action plan of these various state aid control societies. And the selection of site is based on the estimation of HRGs or key populations at the various sites. Next, please. Yeah. So the structure of the TI, as I said, has the peer educator or the key population representative at the base. And these are in the most numbers. And we have a counselor, outreach worker, MND accountant, doctor, etc., being part of this project. And um, there is a continuous system of performance monitoring and evaluation. Next, please. Yeah. So the services that we provide under this are uh, clinical services, enabling environment, behavior change communication, community mobilization, commodity provision, specifically condoms, needle syringe exchange programs, lubricants, and uh, access to HIV and syphilis testing, and clinical services in the form of regular medical checkup and uh, providing um, access to, again, as I said, testing and linkage to treatment. Next, please. Yeah, so the coverage, as far as we are concerned, we are covering close to almost 100% of the female sex workers who are um, uh, contracted under these projects and 90% of uh, men having sex with men, 100% of the injecting drug users, 88% of the TGs, but we have more ground to cover as far as the truckers and prison interventions are concerned. And as we speak, we are uh, redesigning the program uh, to revamp the bridge population interventions. Next, please. So this slide uh, talks of opioid substitution therapy, which has been over the years scaled up to reach 42,274 uh, people uh, who inject drugs on opioid substitution therapy through 265 opioid substitution therapy clinics, partly in the government and some in the NGO sector. Next, please. We'll have to wrap up soon, Dr. Shubin. Yeah, so this is the main slide that we need to discuss, which talks of the budget allocation. 
and the budget allocation as you may see has been fairly consistent over the last so many years and um, this kind of allocation of approximately 60 million us dollars is continuing to be positioned within the uh, future grant period as well next please and uh, what we see is that we are providing approximately 16% of our total budget for uh, interventions for key populations and we've also standardized the process of fund release and it is all done through the public financial management system. And there are audits and there are checks and balances in place. Next, please. So this is a slide I leave for the rest of the people to read in terms of the average cost per TI per year. Next. And I'll skip this. Next, please. Yeah, so there are some innovations for community-led responses in India under the Global Fund supported as well as PEPFA supported projects, which are more like uh, looking at uh, implementation design across limited geographies to see how we can scale up. Sampoon Suraksha strategy is our uh, single window service delivery center, not only for key populations, but, but for all those who are at risk and negative. And we have community system strengthening and prison, prison interventions as part of these. Next, please. And I'd like to uh, also make a reference to the uh, 2020 Key Population Grant under the Global Fund C19 RM mechanism, a total grant of 10 million, which was leveraged by the communities for the communities. And it is uh, it has a saving of 7.6 million US dollars, which are under uh, reprogramming. So I'd just like to conclude by saying that as far as India is concerned, we are very much at in terms of having been able to sustain and fund for key population interventions within domestic budgetary service. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shabini. I'm so sorry to have to rush you there because uh, that's such a fantastic real life example of national programming and how India has really developed uh, comprehensive and sophisticated program for targeting and, and focusing on key populations and they're really rich uh, detail of, of what you're investing in and the programs the the complementary approaches the community-led issues and, and your innovation as well and your your dashboard monitoring and your m e efforts so to see how the response is going and that keeps you on track uh, a fantastic example, really great. So thank you so much. Um, but we are behind and we have to turn over now to um, arguably the most important uh, part of this session, which is hearing from the communities themselves about the funding needs and the, the gaps. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Judy Chang who is the executive director of the International Network of People Who Use Drugs. And Judy is going to facilitate this uh, panel on looking at the community perspectives on funding and needs. Judy, please take over. Thanks very much, Tim. And as you mentioned, yes, we're turning to people at the center of the response. Um, and this panel discussion um, will be of key population community representatives sharing their experiences of barriers to funding um, and also sharing some of the lessons and impact that key population led networks have on the HIV response, despite the funding constraints that we've been hearing about. Um, so first off, I'm really pleased to introduce Angela McBride. She's the executive director of the South African Network of People Who Use Drugs. Um, and Angela, my question for you um, is asking if you can tell us more about what drug user-led networks do in South Africa um, with minimal funding and what could be achieved if there was more and sustainable funding for drug user-led networks. Awesome. Thanks, Judy. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Angela McBride from Stanford. Um, yeah, um, I'm grateful to be here today, and this is really quite a um, a close discussion point to my heart and to Samput's heart, um, because as a peer-led um, network of people who use drugs in South Africa, you know, and having previously been funded by a Global Fund and then uh, not being uh, funded again this round, 
um, it, it is, it's something important because the money um, available, the funding available um, in South Africa for people who use drugs is minimal. Um, and when we speak about people who use drugs led network and funding for le networks led by people who use drugs to implement services, it, it doesn't exist. Um, and only in certain spaces in South Africa um, do people feel comfortable enough to be open about drug use, to be open about their drug use. And as a result, the stigma discrimination um, that we face perpetuates the isolation and the um, and pushing us back. And as a result, people don't feel comfortable enough to access services. And that just in increases um, the risk of HIV and other bloodborne infections that people who use drugs may face, um, as well as other harms and risks. So in South Africa, what we do um, is we work very closely with partners and allies because of this um, lack of funding. And um, a lot of the work is split. So we have um, links and good relationships with um, some harm reduction centers and spaces in South Africa, one of which is Belhaven Harm Redu Reduction Center in, in Durban. Um, and what makes their program so special is it was birthed out of COVID as a response to um, the lockdown and everyone needing to be um, inside and safe. And um, that program just grew and blossomed and it provides OST to about 200 people a day. Um, a building was provided by the municipality um, for the space to continue once um, lockdown uh, levels were lifted. And we've worked closely with them in supporting with when they are funding gaps to um, provide uh, pap smears, um, or not necessary to provide, but to um, work together so that the nurses and the um, social workers at this space could provide services for, for example, women who use drugs to do pap smears for International Women's Day. And this is just some of the examples because ultimately the aim is to be able to reach as many people, have as big of an impact and, and Im help improve the lives of people who use drugs on minimal funding. And the only way we can do that is relationships, um, building relationships with programs, building relationships with government agencies. And even in South Africa, I think once we can get to the point where we're approaching substance use from a harm reduction evidence-based perspective, um, then change can happen. Already we're seeing change happen. Um, and it, it is, it's, it's inspirational, but it's also concerning because there is a need. There's always a need. Um, and as a result, people like in our team, for example, everyone does everything from reporting and data capturing to implementation of activities to um, providing technical assistance and training for gra or like grassroots organizations in SA um, in local areas. Um, and that's the, the thing is it's about working together um, and it's about making it unrestrictive and easy to access because that's another element that always comes up and that is problematic is that not only is the funding restrictive and we're told what to do with the money because that's exactly what happens in SA. Um, we're not given the choice. Very rarely are we given the choice unless it's coming from a funder who actually has an understanding um, of the needs or is willing to listen to the needs of the community. Um, so we sit in spaces where we need to be building relationships with government agencies so that they can provide needles and syringes and disposal of said needles and syringes so that um, government can take ownership of OST methadone um, for people who use drugs, but also so that community-led organizations are the ones who are able to be trained um, and to provide the services as guidelines have spoken highly about. In South Africa, there needs to be more funding for peer-led organizations, for organizations that are run, that are for, that are by people who use drugs. Um, coming from evidence, I keep saying evidence, I know, but it is, it, it, we have to be looking at evidence, otherwise it does, it just perpetuates the stigma and discrimination and the isolation um, that we face. So ultimately in SA, like I say, we work with partners, we work directly with the community, um, we work together to build each other up, and I think that's also the thing, is that a lot of service providers in South Africa get funding from Global Fund, get fu funding from CDC, and there isn't action behind ensuring the people who use drugs who are providing needles and syringes as staff in the team, there isn't that capacitation to 
bring people into the space of like, you are using the service, you are providing the service. Do you want to be providing the service? Do you want to become an organization on your own? How can we build your skills? Unfortunately, that doesn't happen because people use drugs are tokenized. We're stuck in peer education, uh, peer educator levels and outreach worker levels, but there is no room for movement into management. Sorry, thank you, Judy. I appreciate um, the time and yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Angela. Um, fantastic insights there. And, you know, thanks for sharing the example of some of the fantastic harm reduction work um, that is going on in South Africa. And of course, um, sharing your insights on how funding should be delivered to key population led organizations. Um, so next, I turn to Felista Abdullah. She's the national coordinator of the Kenya Sex Workers Alliance. Um, and Felista, um, asking what are the barriers to domestic funding for sex worker programs and sex worker led advocacy and what is being lost when sex worker led organizations are not funded um, and secondly could you tell us a bit more about or a bit about the contribution that sex worker led organizations have made to the national HIV response and ending AIDS and we have about four minutes thanks thank you so much Judy hi oh let me try to put my video on, then I'm going to switch it uh, off because of uh, network. So I think one of the things um, I find it difficult, it's the conversation of us talking about domestic funding, uh, yet as key population, we are still criminalized within our own countries. Uh, because when you talk about a domestic funding, you are talking about a country uh, taking care of their own citizens of which this within my country is still difficult because HIV is still donor funded in my country. So it's going to be very complicated for our government to come out and support us because now we see all the time when a new government is coming in, they're trying to come up with new policies to make sure that they infringe our rights or more policies to make sure that we are criminalized more day in, day out, despite the fact that we work in partnership with the same government, uh, despite the fact that we are doing sensitization day in and day out, uh, but uh, domestic uh, funding conversations uh, with key populations who are criminalized in Kenya, it's still very complicated. I want to use this with an example that the key population consortium of, of, of Kenya decided to have a meeting in Malindi to go and discuss about an application um, of community-led monitoring in Mombasa and how we were supposed to apply for the funding together as key population. When we were in the strategy meeting, uh, police raided into the space and they said they, were, they have been sent for us not to have that meeting. We decided to move the meeting to the next um, hotel and the same thing happened. And they said big people in the government decided that you're not going to do this meeting. But also keep on reminding us that you all should know that you are all key populations and you're still criminalized in Kenya. And anytime we can make any difficult decisions. So I think if we are in this era where key population are actually implementing programs in Kenya, but uh, police are in power to raid our meetings and give us conditions and actually arrest some of the activists and the leaders and directors of the organizations, take them to the police station um, and make it a case, this was very complicated and very difficult for us, yet this is a meeting that was actually supported by paper. So I think we still have a long way to go as key population. And when you're talking about partnership with our government, we are coming out to say, if we want to, to end HIV, if we want to end all the stigma and discrimination, then we need to work in partnership where there's a problem. Let's have sit down, discuss about it. Then from there, we are going to have a domestic funding conversation, but as networks, of key population, we are always ready and attend domestic funding uh, meetings in counties, national, to make sure that when the conversations of budgets are happening, um, at least they're talking about uh, condom procurement, when it comes to health, how do we make sure that the, um, the, the services in some counties where we do not have uh, community-led facilities or friendly uh, key population friendly facilities, this is happening. I also want to talk about the contribution because time is not on my side. I want to say that today in Kenya, we have more than 20 sex workers led organizations that are funded and five of them are running sex workers led uh, facilities or drop-in centers where they give sex workers uh, services. Um, we've seen sex workers coming out to apply funding, different funding, 
some of our members are funded by PEFA, not all of them. And some, I think one of them, which is a sex work led organization, Bar Hostess, is funded by Kenya Red Cross directly, uh, which is the PR implementer within the country. A lot has been done. We've been able to reach a high number of sex workers to receive treatment, uh, stay on treatment, the ones who are not HIV positive, making sure that they stay negative but also addressing violence. One of the things that I've come to see, there's a huge budget for biomedical, but you're still, um, we've, we've tried to come out to fund the structural interventions, but I believe that more can be done around uh, that area. And if funding can try to be a little bit, and um, because there's a lot of, uh, strictness in the funding. Some cases, violence cases that are coming out, these are cases which are supposed to be taken to court and we have a clear follow-up. But most of the time you see the support that is coming in is actually limiting to what can be done and what cannot be done. Let's talk about when, let's talk about the legal barriers that we are facing. Is, is it, isn't it time we start talking about uh, looking at the laws that are affecting us? I think that is a milestone that you are going to go when you talk about structural interventions and support for the structural interventions. A lot of sensitization has been done on the ground by the key populations together in partnership with the Ministry of Health and other implementing partners. I think um, if, if it is not um, pragging as a key population in Kenya, I think we are one of the countries that have really done the uh, Pro, we've really progressed because key populations in Kenya are actually doing a lot of work. We have a voice and we have actually a seat on the table. We are one of the countries who have uh, seats of two key populations uh, at the uh, country coordinating mechanism, whereby the decisions that we make are done by us for us and with us. When it comes to writing, it is us who are doing it. One of the complications that we still have uh, is that when the money comes, it becomes very co complicated for communities to apply. And the platform that was brought in for community to apply is for this money. Actually, it came in as a divide and rule. We were told to apply as a consortium of different key population, but the implementation plan or implementation roadmap, it's not clear. It shows that it is only the lead who has the powers to implement, and then the rest of us are sitting back and watching. So we were wondering, what was the role we were supposed to play into that application? So I think when our funders, PEFA and Global Fund, when they're coming into countries and PRs are coming up with new strategies to make sure that the communities have applied and they get the money to do the work. Do we, is, is this thing going to work with us? How do we make sure that we work this work together? And when it comes to application, it is something that we have worked together with the PR and other people together with the KCM members. It is something that is workable for the communities with the community so that we can be able to run this work. People are talking about, gun okay. Yeah, sorry, thank you so thank much, you so much um, Sorry, yeah, as you mentioned before, time is not on our side, but yeah, really important um, considerations as we're coming into NFM4 and of course um, the COP. And thank you, of course, so much for really highlighting the role of criminalisation and the inherent tension between um, domestic funding and criminalisation and your important point about the need to have real dialogues about addressing structural barriers and, of course, funding for community-led advocacy to address structural barriers. Um, I know, yes, we're very close to time. Um, I'd like to ask Inad Rendon, Program Manager for APCOM Foundation, um, the next question. I know you have some slides as well, Inad. Um, so again, yes, can you tell us the barriers to domestic funding for gay men and other men who have sex with men programs and key population led advocacy and what is being lost when key population led organizations are not funded. And also, can you tell us about the importance of addressing intersectionalities also. And we have three, four minutes. <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> thank you, Judy. Um, thank you for thank you very much uh, for for having me here. Um, in relation to the domestic funding, I think um, it is very much important uh, for the key population led uh, networks and PLHIV networks to be um, funded in terms of organizational uh, strengthening. Uh, there needs to have a, an organizational support in preparing and reviewing. Um, uh, grant applications, reviewing budgets, developing financial reports, uh, and all organizational operational functions that a network or that is needed from a network or from, from a HIV group. Um, there also needs to have 
uh, an expansion of KT-led or community-led service delivery to include more clinical services such as the community-based ART for people living with HIV, HIV testing and PrEP for MSM, harm reduction for or risk reduction for people inject drugs and MSM who are engaged in cam sex, hormone therapy for transgender community and health uh, services for sex workers. Now this can be done only when there is enough domestic financing uh, at the country level and intersectionalities can be addressed if there is a holistic approach towards the sustainability or, or, uh, or the um, making sure that there is enough funding um, for the programs. So when I say sustainability, it's not only about the avail availability of funding. For an HIV program to be sustainable, um, first, there also must be programmatic sustainability. Uh, does a specific program or intervention make sense in an integrated primary care system? Um, is there, a, uh, is it, uh, does it, does it make sense for one service to transition to another service um, in relation to intersectionality of uh, the health needs of, of a key population? Second, is there a political sustainability? Will, will HIV and AIDS remain in the political agenda of, of, of a country? Third, the structural sustainability. Is the social and environmental context enabling for a long-term effective response? A sustainable HIV response requires focus not only on securing financial resources, but also addressing structural barriers at the country level. And domestic investments is needed to ensure that we are addressing uh, the structural barriers at the country level. Fourth, the epidemiological sustainability. Is there a trend of declining new HIV infections and AIDS-related death? One measure of epidemiological sustainability is when the number of people on treatment is greater than the number of new infections. And I think that's where the EPIC program under, PEPFAR project, uh, under the PEPFAR is uh, working on. And fifth is the human rights. Um, how will the right to health be protected for key populations who might be excluded from the decision-making based on the five points that I have uh, mentioned? Um, in terms of the key population-led and PLHID-led um, groups, it is also true that we need to produce our own evidence. Um, we, for us, who are leading the advocacy, we have to know as well what we, uh, what we can, what we should be advocating for in terms of uh, funding. Um, not to put the far on the spotlight, but I am just using the one that we did uh, during the COP uh, exercises earlier this year. Uh, based on the most recent engagement that we have in the COPROP in 10 countries or in 12 countries, uh, PEFR countries in Asia, um, we have uh, developed an analysis of the budgets um, of uh, or uh, budget allocations uh, under the COPROP, PEFR COPROP towards key population um, programs. So if you can see on the slides, the first, sl the first column is the one that is approved based on the uh, PEFR website on COP21. And on the second column, the, the second column on COPROP 21 is the KB budget, uh, which is reported uh, the, the budget allocations um, into the countries directed towards key populations uh, programs. And as you can see, uh, there are several informations that are absent. Um, in Papua New Guinea, there is zero um, key pop there is zero budget allocated for key population programs. And when I say key population programs, it's the entire key population. Um, the data is not even disaggregated whether the, the, the allocation is for MSM for transgender, for people who inject drugs, for sex workers, um, and for transgender community. Um, so if we are going to uh, uh, advocate for the COP prop, which is up, upcoming for January, uh, February, as what we have heard earlier, and also for NFM4, we have to know as the, the leaders of this advocacy or of this movement, we have to know how much are we advocating for for the countries and how much we are missing in terms of the budget gaps allocations. Um, I have provided a copy of these slides and some explanations for each of the country, and I think um, uh, that will be shared with the participants as well. So um, that's from my side. Thank you so much, Judy, and thank you so much for being for inviting me for to be part of this panel. Thank you so much, Ined, and the reminder for us to keep our eye on the ball and also the role of, of course, community-led um, monitoring also. Um, so with three minutes over time, I'll just turn to Tim to give the closing and the final remarks. Um, do we have a fourth speaker? Oh, sorry, I should have mentioned at the beginning, um, Jay was not able to make it um, oh, okay. at the moment, so. Right, okay. Well, yeah, look, thank you so much, Judy, and all of the community representatives who've uh, really given us some a little bit of insight into the challenges and how you're doing so much with so little. And 
something, sometimes everything with nothing. And uh, I, I always think that the COVID situation has just exacerbated the situation and really made it so much harder and traumatic for, for people who have got no money at all. And um, so really you have shown how you've really illustrated um, the issues here about the lack of funding, the need for focusing and prioritizing key population responses for prioritizing key population empowerment and community leadership. We know these are the most effective ways of responding to the HIV pandemic. And so it, it leaves us really hanging in terms of uh, how do we keep encouraging funders, both donors, but increasingly domestic, national and local governments to invest in the responses that are supporting key populations, that are empowering key populations to enable them to mobilize and organize and lead the responses. Uh, and to become more um, the scale of the programs, the breadth of the programs. We know what works and uh, we really just need now to, to put the funding into practice and, and to keep encouraging all sources of evidence-based and informed and, and, and go to where we can maximize the response. And that is about supporting key populations. We've gone over time, um, but we could have gone a lot longer. And I think uh, this has been, as I said at the start, one of the most important online virtual meetings that the community of practice has um, delivered. And I wanted to thank all the, all the presenters and all the speakers. We've had a, such a rich discussion today. Um, we've got it recorded and I feel this is really needs to be further circulated. We're only just sort of scratching the surface of the people who need to listen to this, these issues and think about them and um, how we can really scale up the funding and uh, make sure that it's allocated in the most effective way. And we've heard what needs to happen. Uh, it's still not happening. So um, all of us, I think, who've been involved here today can take away some thoughts and, and contribute to ideas, please, about what, what we can do to further uh, increase uh, and, and focus funding to, towards key population programs and key population empowerment. Thank you, everyone. That draws this meeting to a close. Um, so we will look forward to a series of webinars next year. And um, I think it's been a, a really rich and very focused discussions we've had throughout 2022. And we want to continue that next year in terms of uh, continuing to support key populations in their efforts. Thank you so much. I'll draw it to a close here. Goodbye.